Will dust make interstellar travel impossible? Is Omomo unique in its weird cigar-like shape? How many nuclear reactors will we need on the moon? And in Q&A Plus, does studying the universe have an ending? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Scotty Cartercom, what is your favorite planet and moon and why? Saturn and Titan. Why? Like obvious. Like I have to explain this. Saturn has rings. Titan has like an atmosphere. It's crazy. So yeah, Titan and Saturn. And they would be my favorites even if they were separated, but they're together. And then my other like favorite weird moon is Iapetus, which is also a moon of Saturn. So everything is in the Saturnian system. B dubs. Are there any other known objects that closely resemble Oumuamua in shape and size? No, not really. Oumuamua is pretty bizarre. Um, it has like a 10 to 1 length to width ratio. So it's, you know, they described it as like cigar shaped or cylindrical shaped or rendezvous with Rama shaped, but it is a long object. Now, there have been plenty of explanations for why you could have something like that. Like there was a cloud of uh, liquid hydrogen that was ejected out of a out of a solar system and it was spinning in it. The particles froze into this long shape. You know, there are explanations that can explain it. Obviously, there are people who think that it could be an example of a, uh, you know, some intelligent civilization's interstellar probe. Uh, that seems far fetched, but you know, you can't rule it out until we actually send that mission to chase it down. But but no, it is not the kind of shape that we see for stuff here in the solar system. And like, does it mean that other solar systems are producing objects that are, uh, you know, different shapes? Uh, or is it just that we just haven't sampled enough objects here in the solar system and that once we see more comets coming from the Oort cloud, this is going to feel like a much more common object? You know, I feel like I'm a broken record, but the thing that's going to help us is Vera Rubin. So it is exquisitely designed to find interstellar objects. And so while we know of two so far, we will probably learn of dozens every year, thanks to Vera Rubin. And by the end, it's going to be hundreds. Uh, and some of these will be really good targets for us to send missions to. And so you can imagine, like right now, the European Space Agency is considering a spacecraft called the, um, the Comet Interceptor. And this could also be an interstellar interceptor. So something that would go out to the L2 Lagrange point, loiter around, wait for a target. And then when either like a long period comet is coming in from the Earth cloud or an interstellar object has been discovered, then it will kick on its engines and go and, and intercept the object, take pictures up close, which I think is a really cool idea. And so Vera Rubin could turn up another object that has similar characteristics to Oumuamua. Like I think people don't realize how little of the sky is being observed on a regular basis the way Vera Rubin is going to do this. It is an entirely new window into the universe that is about to come operational. Man, watching the coverage of Vera Rubin was very frustrating to me, you know, for the mainstream media because people just like didn't get the point. Like, you know, this Great new, you know, big new observatory. Look at these pretty pictures. It's really cool. It's the best. It's the biggest camera ever made. You know, now onto the weather, right? I'm like, no, you don't get it. This is, this is what, you know, this is the television versus print. This is, you know, this is a totally new paradigm, a new revolution in astronomy. And it's going to change everything. But it's fine. I'll do my job. I'll report it. You'll see. You'll all see. Ask Annie 21, if dust gets on the lens of a space telescope, how much dust would be a problem for a super fast spacecraft? Would dust render interstellar travel impossible? So this is one of the questions that people have absolutely had about interstellar travel, that if you were traveling in between the stars and you're going to travel at relativistic speed, say 20% the speed of light, then you are going to be bumping into the stuff that is in between space. And there's not a lot of stuff. It is a ludicrously empty vacuum and you could count a few hundred particles of protons per cubic meter. Like there's not a lot of stuff out there, but there is some stuff and there are definitely particles of dust. The question is, we don't know how many there are. Nobody has ever done this survey. We know there's a lot of dust here in the solar system, especially a lot of dust orbiting around the Earth, but that's to be expected because there's a lot of asteroids crashing into each other, there's space junk, there's all kinds of stuff. And so one of the big questions right now that people don't know the answer to is like just how much dust is out there? 
but it's not as terrible as you would think that it would be. So if you had a single grain of sand strike a spacecraft, it would do damage. And so you would want to have some kind of shield in front of you, like a physical shield, like a plate of metal. But it doesn't have to be a lot, like a few centimeters of aluminum is probably enough to protect your spacecraft from part, small particles of dust, things that are in the, you know, the microns across. Larger pieces of dust or, or even little asteroids, yeah, you could be hitting yourself with a bomb and you just have to hope that it doesn't hit. And so the current ideas for interstellar spacecraft that they will probably have some kind of ablative shield in the front of the spacecraft that's going to take the guaranteed ions that are going to be hitting it. But that's more like like actually probably won't reduce it more than a few millimeters and they can handle the occasional piece of dust that could be out there. And we don't know how many, you know, the ratio, how many of them are out there. Um, but the but the way you solve this problem is you send a lot of spacecraft. So like Breakthrough Starshot is planning on sending thousands, tens of thousands of tiny little, or I guess 10 meter across solar sails that weigh a couple of grams and just send them one after the other. And some are going to get destroyed in transit. Some are going to go offline. Some are going to break down. But as long as some make it there, then we will be able to get the data from Alpha Centauri or Proxima Centauri or whatever. Fred Jonestown's, how long until we reach Enceladus? A while? So back at the last decadal survey in 2020, the scientific community came together and they posted their priorities. Number one priority, Mars sample return mission. Number two priority, a uh, mission to Uranus or Neptune. Number three priority, a mission to Enceladus. Ideally, some kind of lander, the Enceladus orb lander. And, you know, we're not going to get the Mars sample return mission, we're not going to get the Uranus mission, and we're not going to get the Enceladus mission this time around. Who knows? Maybe when the astronomical community comes back together for the decadal survey in 2030, and they will say the same priorities because they haven't been met yet, then maybe NASA and other space agencies will be in a better place to be able to do it. That said, I am reporting nonstop on potential mission ideas to Enceladus. Like if you go to Universe Today, which you should, anytime I see somebody proposing an idea for going to Enceladus, we will run a story about it. And I've done several interviews here on the channel about it. So, you know, if you're interested, people have really good ideas about how we could explore Enceladus, land near the geysers, be able to sample them directly, uh, hoppers that could jump through the geyser to be able to sample them, uh, really cool solar sails that could get you out to Enceladus very quickly. There's a lot of really good ideas, sampling and calculating your results while you're out there or doing a sample return and bringing them home. They're great ideas, you know, and that's my that's what our whole channel is about. That's what Universe Today is all about is this kind of thing. And every time I see anyone just put their neck out and propose an idea for sending a mission to Enceladus, I am all over it. But realistically, you know, we've got to know that it's going to take us a long time before this actually happens. I would say in the 2040s, maybe the 2050s, it's time to shout out all the new $5 patrons and above. Rich Walker, Jason Adams, Steve Fulton, Yakik Gajowicz, Jim Murphy, Wade Lee, Eccentric Chuck, Arik Nowalski, Lamonte H.P. Yarrell, and Michael Lesh. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Hammerfan, let's assume we can find clear evidence of an advanced alien civilization with our telescopes. How do you think it's going to influence our society from there on? And how would it influence your job? So I think like a lot of people think that if that we found evidence of an alien civilization out there in the universe, that it would destroy human society, that we would freak out, we would lose our minds, religions would be destroyed, that it would just be chaos on Earth. And I don't think so. I think that humanity's capacity to absorb new knowledge and then just carry on like nothing has happened is bottomless. And so I think, you know, in the beginning, yeah, I would be reporting on every attempt to understand like my job would never end at that point, because we would be reporting on all of the spacecraft, all of the, um, you know, all of the observations, all the new telescopes that are being developed, to try and analyze this, all of the messages, the messages we're sending, the messages we're receiving, um, what we've learned so far, are, you know, now that we've got a way of understanding, what have we learned more about? Like we, this would go on forever, right? But I think regular people 
would be like, oh yeah, I remember when they discovered aliens. That was pretty weird. Um, but now I'm just going to go about my regular life and get on with my job and live my life. And so when you think about the kinds of either incredibly good events or traumatic events that, that we can live through and just sort of reset to our new normal, finding evidence of aliens out there in the cosmos would would we would be back to normal within some very short period of time it would be big news and then it wouldn't and then it would just be you know normal news from that point on yeah uh, it's kind of i always like we're just so capable of turning everything into this kind of bland outcome any alexander will fraser ever tell us his favorite lagrange point we all know he has one it's probably the earth moon l4 point if i like had a favorite it'd probably be that one Oh, you want to know why? Um, it's a stable point, a place you could put a space station. You know, when you think back to the Gerard O'Neill, uh, the L5 Society, L5 would be fine as well. You know, these are these places where you could put a large rotating space station. I'm still all in on giant rotating space stations as the future of, of humanity in space, not colonizing Mars, like living in space. Uh, but you need some kind of artificial gravity. Gravity wells are for suckers. So yeah, and and in order to really make that work, you want to go to the L4, L5 Lagrange points. So either L4 or L5, either will do. Those are my favorites. John Razdick 195. What do you think about the possibility of caverns in the moon being used for moon bases? I think it's a great idea. You know, there are not a lot of places on the moon where you can get some kind of relief from that temperature shift, the hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. But you can in the collapsed lava tubes on the moon. So you've got these places where there was once lava flowing and then uh, it emptied out in this giant chamber. And these things can be big, like they can be 10 kilometers tall. And then you've got like the roof collapsed a little bit. So you've got this skylight at the top. But if you set up down at the bottom of this lava tube, then you are protected from the radiation from space, you don't need to build radiation shielding, you have some protection over the temperature back and forth. I mean, you're in the shade, so it's cold, but you can put some kind of solar panels outside or you can try to use some kind of regolith battery to heat up the regolith around you and keep the place warm. So they're the most interesting places. And again, we've had dozens of articles on universe today about exploring lava tubes on the moon. So definitely check that out. Encoded PR, how many nuclear reactors do we need on the moon? It just depends on how much power we want to be able to have on the moon during the nighttime. So during the daytime, solar power is great. It's all you need. Plus, you're out in the sunlight, and so you can stay warm. The trick is that you need to be able to have base load power, something that will keep you going during that 14 day lunar night. Nuclear reactors are the solution to that. And so you could build a fission reactor and fission reactors have been tested in space. Uh, the Soviets tested 22 of them. And the Americans tested one fission reactor in space. So this has been done. And there might even be others that we don't even know of they are classified. So you could absolutely take a fission reactor that would provide you with 1000s of kilowatts hundreds of kilowatts, maybe a 1000 kilowatts, a megawatt on the surface of the moon. And then you would have enough power to be able to do with everything you need. When you think about space missions, right? Like what are the top three priorities? They're always power, power and power. If you can get power, then you can do a lot of other stuff. But if you don't have power, then your spacecraft dies when the sun goes down below the horizon. Gangster Daddy 510. I understand that we are receiving much weaker signals from distant spacecraft, but why are the data rates dramatically reduced? We talk louder, not slower, with increasing distance. Right. So the problem is signal to noise. So when you're very close and you are transmitting, then you are getting a lot of signal. And then the noise, the background radio traffic that is happening, the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, radio sources, pulsars, like there's a lot of radio signal out there. And the strength of your transmitter as it gets weaker and weaker and weaker, as you get farther and farther away, as you said, with the inverse square law, it gets harder and harder to distinguish between the signals that you're sending from your spacecraft and just the background. And so what they do is called error correction, where they will uh, put a lot of additional information into making sure that the recipient 
actually is receiving the right data and they're actually getting the information and that takes up bandwidth. And so you are still transmitting at the speed of light. You're still transmitting with the full bandwidth, but you experience this, right? Like when you go farther away from your Wi-Fi, uh, you've noticed that your Wi-Fi speed goes down. Uh, you know, that is because the signal is getting harder and harder for your computer to be able to pick that up and to be able to distinguish between the other, you know, radio sources that are around in, in your environment. And so error correction has to really kick in to be able to do that. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, will we be studying the universe forever? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who put your questions into the YouTube comments, as well as everybody who joined me for last week's live show, where many of these questions were generated. Now we're on our summer live stream hiatus, so we won't be doing that, but we'll be doing other live events this summer. Now, last episode, I recommended some activities to do this summer. Now I'm going to recommend some basic gear that you might want to get your hands on if you want to appreciate astronomy. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caredwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilson, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Spitz, Michael Purcell, Monzo, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Filer Munley, Vlad Shivlin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So last episode, I recommended some things you can do this summer. And, you know, all of those things are with your own eyeballs. You don't need any gear. But if you do have some gear, then you can make the experience better. And there's sort of two pieces of gear that I recommend. One is a book. And this is a book that can help you find your constellations and learn more about the night sky. And the book is called Night Watch. It was the book that I used as a teenager to learn my constellations and start using my first telescope that I bought when I was 13 years old. And it's still in print and it's still very accurate. So they're, you know, and they come up with new versions that have updated information. Uh, so check out Night Watch, the book, and it opens up nicely and has great sky maps. The other thing that I recommend is is a pair of binoculars, ideally astronomical binoculars. Now you can just use any binoculars. So if you've got binoculars kicking around, bring those with you. And then when you're out watching for the Perseids, spend some time looking through the binoculars, comparing information on the, the night watch, learn your constellations. You're going to be lying under those stars for hours and hours and hours. So definitely do that. Uh, but if you want even better binoculars, I recommend astronomical binoculars. And the ones that I have are 15 by 70 Celestron Skymasters, and they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, but you can just use those to look at the night sky. You can get uh, even better, bigger binoculars, but they're very heavy. So I wouldn't recommend going beyond the 15 by 70. Those will let you see the rings of Saturn. They'll let you see the moons of Jupiter and the moon looks amazing. So it gives you a really good sense of of what it's like to look in the night sky. But you can also see globular star clusters, open star clusters, even galaxies like Andromeda just in those pair of binoculars. And it's a great way to get started. So uh, night watch and a pair of binoculars. All right, good luck, and uh, we will see you next time.